Well, I've, I've been on several panels over the last several years, but this is an entirely new experience for me. Uh, primarily because, uh, you know, the, the, the act of suicide uh, really is so marginal to my experience that I have to, like you said, approach it from a, from a very different kind of a perspective than the people who have, have talked about it. And what uh, amazes me, um, and I, I, I may be jumping the gun here, uh, is that uh, quite a few of the points that were made in the testimonies, um, you know, uh, yours as well as the uh, ones that we saw anonymously, uh, are coming through the judgments that are being made on, on uh, issues of suicide, uh, court judgments. And which just tells me that, you know, um, judges uh, don't really live in ivory towers. They, they seem to actually connect with, uh, with the people uh, that they, you know, whose lives they, they ultimately uh, rule over. Uh, now, my um, experience uh, with this uh, topic is primarily because um, both the films that I've made, uh, this one is uh, the expert excerpt from a, from a feature film. Um, it's a two-hour feature film uh, based on a true incident that happened in February 1988 in Kanpur. Uh, and the other one is uh, on uh, Jain religious practice that uh, involves uh, fasting unto death. Uh, it's an, an entirely, it's entirely coincidental that uh, uh, both my films are uh, dealing with end-of-life issues. I have no obsession with, uh, with death, which is a question I'm always asked at uh, you know, post-screening discussions, so I'll, I'll get that out straight away. Uh, yeah, the, when we started this uh, film, uh, Kundan and I, uh, we actually uh, were given uh, we were part of a, of a scheme uh, you know, from a production house which wanted to, which had made a lot of money from a commercial film that they had made. And I think to assuage their own conscience, they were uh, uh, setting aside a little money to, you know, these experimental walas, you know, uh, they, were, they were kind of trying to give some stuff. And uh, Kundan and I chose this topic because uh, if you see the entire film, there is a, uh, we've done a lot of uh, what you might call uh, push the envelope or, or, or push the frontiers uh, in terms of the, the uh, narrative structure and, and some other things. Uh, and I got involved uh, a little in the, in the research of it. And uh, the, one of the first things that I realized was that uh, though we were making a film about a particular incident, um, Actually, it was quite rampant. You'll be amazed that uh, between uh, 1988, which was the first uh, such incident, and uh, 2004, when we actually made the film, there were, I think, at least about six or seven uh, incidents of three or four sisters uh, committing suicide together. The modes of how they went about it were different. You know, some threw themselves um, in front of trains, some, you know, uh, leapt out of buildings. Uh, um, others, like this, uh, in this case, uh, they um, hung themselves with their dupattas from ceiling fans. Uh, so yes, the, uh, the social aspect of it is uh, that it's not an isolated case. And there is, I would think, um, unfortunately, I'm, I, I'm only a brother, I don't have sisters, so I don't know the, the dynamic of, of how sisters interact, really. But there must be something to this, that uh, three sisters um, get together and uh, decide that, you know, our going will help our family. Uh, that, that was the dominant kind of a thought that, you know, uh, kept, came through, yeah. This also brings me to, uh, you know, theories around uh, suicide that Durkheim came up with, you know, where uh, 
he looked at suicide as not a psychological act, but uh, an act brought about by uh, society either through uh, you know, an integration that was too strong or an integration that wasn't strong enough. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what comes to mind is that all the various kinds of stories that we've heard uh, you know, actually fall into you know, some obvious categorization or the other. Um, I'm also now wondering if we can talk a little about, since you're a lawyer, you're a professor of law, um, uh, you know, if we can talk about where we stand uh, as a society, um, you know, in terms of the legal perspective on suicide, you know, because there have been changes in law, uh, but uh, in our conversation, I mean, what I discovered was that the changes aren't really uh, as dramatic as one had thought they were, and perhaps you can sort of take us through that timeline of um, you know how uh, the manner in which suicide is viewed uh, by the Indian legal system or the, the Indian government has changed over the years. Okay, so uh, sorry. Uh, rather than just talk about the law, the, the, how the legal system is looking at it, let me broad base the, uh, my answer, my response, by telling you how the Indian state uh, has been uh, looking at it. And as you all know, uh, you know, from your civics class in school, uh, the state comprises the legislature, which uh, makes laws. Uh, the judiciary which interprets those laws and the executive which um, administers or implements those laws. Now, uh, let's first, let me take you through all the three. Uh, let's see how the Indian legislature has down the years uh, looked at suicide. Uh, the Indian Penal Code, uh, which is very much in, in vogue uh, right now, was enacted in 1816. Uh, and came into force in 1862. Now there is one uh, section of that uh, particular statute which, say, which states that whoever attempts to commit suicide and does any act towards the commission of such offense shall be punished with simple imprisonment for a term which may extend to one year or with fine or with both. Now this is the uh, the crux of, of the debate over uh, you know, how we are going to look at uh, uh, suicide from a sociological or a legal or a, uh, you know, a governmental perspective. Uh, interestingly, uh, section 84 of that same uh, statute, the IPC, talks of act of a person of unsound mind and makes an exception and says, nothing is an offense which is done by a person who at the time of doing it by reason of unsoundness of mind is incapable of knowing the nature of the act or that he is doing what is either wrong or contrary to law. Now, this is the IPC. We also have something called the Code of Criminal Procedure, which, uh, which is of 1973 vintage. And uh, sections 328 to 339 deal with trial procedures for persons of unsound mind. This is how the law looks at uh, people with, uh, with this kind of, uh, you could say, uh, problem. Persons of unsound mind who are accused of criminal acts. Now, the most outrageous uh, thing that the Indian legislature over the years, over, uh, over the decades rather, uh, did was to enact a law called the Indian Lunacy Act in 1912. This was before, the, before independence, so it was a, uh, done by the Britishers. You know what it basically recommended? That all un lunatics should be locked away in asylums. Now, the criticism generally has been that the laws uh, that have been legislated uh, tended towards uh, a binary classification. You know, that is either a person is normal or he's a rank lunatic, uh, you know, or a person with what you might call a permanent mental abnormality. And thus, these laws have overlooked an important fact, which is that even a so-called normal person could 
have a temporary mental aberration which would compel him to act in a way that is not in conformity with the law. Now in 1950, that is after independence, uh, members of the Indian Psychiatric Society who were outraged by this uh, uh, Indian Lunacy Act initiated a campaign to replace the Indian L L Lunacy Act uh, with a more nuanced kind of an act. And this came in the form of the Mental Health Act of 1959, which was followed by the Mental Health Act of 1987. Now, uh, the good news is that the latest initiative has been the Mental Health Care Bill of 2016, which led to the enactment of the Mental Health Care Act of 2017, which came into effect in 2018. Now, here's the good news. Uh, although Section 309 is still in force, the Mental Health Care Act 2017, which came into effect, like I said, in July 2018, has restricted its application. The relevant portion of that, or provision of that uh, new act, which is Section 115, states, Notwithstanding anything contained in Section 309 of the Indian Penal Code, any person who attempts to commit suicide shall be presumed, unless proved otherwise, to have severe stress and shall not be tried and punished under the said code. It also says the appropriate government shall have a duty to provide care, treatment, and rehabilitation to such a person having severe stress and who attempted to commit suicide to reduce the risk of recurrence of the attempt to commit suicide. Now, as you can pretty much figure out, the Mental Health Care Act does not repeal that section, which we're all you know, uh, agitated about, but it provides the presumption of mental illness by which you can uh, pretty much uh, get away from the from the law. So this is how the uh, legislature has approached suicide. Now, let me come to the timeline of some landmark court judgments and see how the Indian judiciary has looked at suicide. One of the first judgments uh, on or landmark judgments uh, on suicide, and I'm restricting myself now to primarily the high courts and the Supreme Court, because uh, as the higher judiciary, uh, their rulings have uh, a certain gravitas which the lower courts don't normally have. Now, Delhi High Court uh, in 1985, you must remember this name, uh, Justice Rajinder Sachar. The, the Sachar Commission, yeah. Now, when he was the uh, judge in the Delhi High Court, uh, he wrote this judgment in what is called the State versus Sanjay Kumar Bhatia in 1985. And let me, let me just read out just a small portion from the judgment because it kind of reverberates and resonates with uh, what our testimonies have been. And uh, Justice Sachar wrote, it's a strange paradox that in the age of votaries of euthanasia, suicide should be criminally punishable. Instead of the society hanging its head in shame that there should be such strains that a young man, who is the hope of tomorrow, should be driven to suicide, compounds its inadequacy by treating the boy as a criminal. Instead of sending the young boy to a psychiatric clinic, it gleefully sends him to mingle with criminals, as if trying its best to see that in future he does fall foul of the punitive sections of the penal code. In 1986, something very interesting happened. Uh, there was this uh, court case where uh, a police constable from the Bombay police force uh, met with an accident. And uh, after that, he was never his normal self. 
uh, he went through bouts of depression. And he wanted the state to help him. So he went to the municipal commissioner in Bombay and asked, uh, you know, he applied for a vegetable vendor's license for his wife. Uh, you know, the, the application went through the process and you know what the process means. So it was just delayed forever. So he once physically kind of, you know, barged in into the municipal commissioner's office and he was literally thrown out by the security. So what he did was he came the next day, I think, and he poured kerosene over himself. He sat outside the office on the road, poured kerosene over himself, and was about to light himself, and people kind of stopped him. And what they did was they actually prosecuted him for under 309. Fortunately for him, he got a very, very committed group of lawyers who fought the case for him. And uh, he also found a sympathetic judge who reasoned as follows. Now, this is one year after the Sanjay Kumar Bhatia case. The judge said, every fundamental right, like every other right, has a positive and a negative aspect. For instance, you know, uh, we have the right to speech. The converse of it is that we have a right to keep silent. There is a very famous case, you all should you know, look it up. It's called the Bijou Emmanuel case of 1986, where a group of children belonging to parents who owed allegiance to Jehovah's Witnesses refused, <coughs> sorry, refused to sing the national anthem in school. And so they were thrown out of school. And the parents uh, brought up the case uh, and they won because, you know, uh, the right to remain silent was seen as the converse of the right to uh, speak. Similarly, there's another case where uh, the right to open a business uh, was seen as, or seen to coexist with the right to close it. And uh, that's part of what's called the Excel Ware case in 1978. Now, according to the judge who wrote the Dubal judgment, Maruti Dubal was the name of the uh, police constable, he reasoned that it follows logically that the right to live as recognized by Article 21 of the Indian Constitution will also include a right not to live or not to be forced to live. To put it positively, he added, it would include a right to die or to terminate one's life. Dubal made quite a splash. The, this uh, case became a, a, a major kind of a, a landmark in this timeline. Till uh, the Supreme Court, in a case called P. Rathinam versus the Union of India in 1994, ruled uh, again, against uh, the uh, section, uh, section 309. And Justice Hansaria, here's another aspect of looking at suicide. He wrote, and I quote, on the basis of what has been held and noted above, I mean, he was referring to the cases that I said, uh, that I uh, mentioned, we state, that is the court states, that section 309 of the Indian Penal Code deserves to be effaced from the statute book to humanize our penal laws. It's a cruel and irrational provision and it may result in punishing a person doubly who has already suffered agony and would be undergoing ignominy because of his failure to commit suicide. Then again, an act of suicide cannot be said to be against religion, morality or public policy and an attempt and an act to a, of attempted suicide has no baneful effect on society at large. Further, suicide, suicide or attempt to commit it causes no harm to others because of which the state's interference with the personal liberty of the persons concerned is not called for. We therefore hold that section 309 violates article 21 and so it is void. Now these are the three uh, judgments in this timeline 
which are very strongly uh, for either abolishing or curtailing the effect of this law, which a lot of people think is draconian for good reason. But unfortunately for them, in 1996, March of 1996, I mentioned March, you'll know why. The Supreme Court, the Justice, uh, you know, Verma, uh, ruled in this Gyan Kaur case. And uh, in order to understand this judgment properly, I have brought the Constitution of India with me. Uh, you, you must know that this is the, this book is a flavor of the season. I see, uh, I see uh, a lot of people who've never touched this book read preambles at, uh, at uh, protests all across the country. And it warms my heart no end uh, as a professor of constitutional law to get, to get students to read this book is a, is, a, is, a, is a task for us. And here are people who are doing it on their own. Uh, what you see here in Article 21, You know, uh, the Constitution has several articles, and many of those articles have what are called head notes or headlines. Very often, these headlines are seen as uh, avenues for interpreting the rest of the article. Now, this uh, Article 21, and I'll read the body of the article first, and then the headline. It says, no person, no person, Remember, uh, the Constitution is very clear. Whether you are a citizen of this country or not, you just come here, even if you are a terrorist you know, from another place, no person shall be deprived of his life or personal liberty except according to procedure established by law. Now, the headline of this article is interesting. The headline of this article, or the head note, is protection of life and personal liberty. And what uh, Justice Verma did when he uh, ruled in the Gyankaur case, Gyankaur case was a case of uh, 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 a Sikh couple who abetted or supported or encouraged or helped or assisted in the suicide of uh, either a relative or, or, or a neighbor or something, and they were brought to uh, book for this. Now, Justice Verma wrote, listen to this, the right to life is a natural right embodied in Article 21, but suicide is an unnatural termination or extinction of life, and therefore, and therefore incompatible and inconsistent with the concept of right to life. He went by the head note, which said protection. When there is a provision that allows you protection, how can you even think of destroying something that you're, you know, you're provided, the provision allows for protecting? Since Article 21 is a provision guaranteeing protection of life and personal liberty, by no stretch of imagination can extinction of life be read to be included in protection of life. And so we were back to square one. After, after three uh, rather uh, path-breaking uh, judgments, we were back to square one. Uh, and what happened immediately after that was that in March, this uh, judgment came out in March 1996. In August 1996, the Dubal case came up for review, for, for an appeal to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court used this logic to say no. So, you know, Dubal was punished. After that, the, the most recent case, which we discussed the other day, was uh, the Aruna Shanbagh case. And uh, that is passive uh, uh, euthanasia. Uh, what it did, essentially, was saying that uh, you cannot actively um, quote-unquote, mercy kill uh, Aruna Shanbhag. However, uh, if in the future we find cases uh, which 
uh, which adhere to the parameters that we've put forth, uh, then, then maybe, uh, you know, passive euthanasia is possible. So that's how the Indian judiciary has, uh, has approached it. Now, very briefly, let me tell you what the Indian executive uh, has done over the years uh, in relation to suicide. Now, uh, you know, this, the executive, a lot of people think that uh, the executive cannot uh, make laws. They're only there to administer it, which is not true. Uh, there is something called delegated legislation where uh, the legislature allows the executive to make laws. You know, you can't imagine the parliament uh, uh, sitting and debating whether a certain road should be one way or two way, right, in, in, in Delhi or any other city. So it allows the executive to make that law. But it's a law because if you violate it, you can be penalized. So uh, that is one way in which the executive makes laws. The other way is uh, by not exactly making laws, but influencing the making of laws by uh, selecting uh, legal luminaries and forming what are called law commissions. And the law commission is a group which has a three year uh, period and it gets uh, you know, renewed. Uh, there's an overhaul every three years. Uh, they primarily are involved in legal reforms. Now, the law commissions of 1971 and 2008 expressly recommended repealing Section 309. But they only uh, have the power of recommendation. They cannot actually uh, enforce anything. Now, let me uh, tell you something else that uh, the executive helps people like me who are doing uh, you know, legal research in. Uh, they provide us a lot of statistics. There is something called the National Crime Records Bureau, which has recorded that, and I don't know if this comes as a surprise to some of you all, it came as a surprise to me, that one of every three suicides all over the world happens in India. Uh, furthermore, this country has the highest rate of suicide among young women, highest rate in the world, okay? Uh, young women between 19 and 29 years, that age group. And 2015, which is the latest record that I have, the National Crime Records Bureau recorded 1,33,623 suicides. What also happens is interesting here, is uh, the former Director General of uh, uh, West Bengal and now the State Security Advisor, uh, his name is Surojit Purkayasta. Uh, he did some research and found that while the, state of, uh, while the rate of conviction in usual crimes in which the police file charge sheets is around 10%, in cases dealing with Section 309 of the IPC, the conviction rate is as high as 30%. This is something else that is, that is very interesting and needs to be looked into. Of course, now that uh, 309 has been uh, kind of curtailed, we may not have this same statistic. But the fact that uh, the police are extra zealous in, uh, in prosecuting people who commit or attempt to commit suicide is, is really something very startling. There are times when sections are contradictory, mm -hmm. right? Like you gave a couple of examples. So who decides which article is more important, which section is more important, how the judge or the law decides that this is more important when there's a contradiction very clear. For example, right to practice religion and right to live. I think I just gave you the examples of three judges who looked at uh, uh, suicide in, in a particular fashion and the fourth judge who actually made use of the headline to totally kind of wipe out uh, what the others, other three had said. So that's exactly how it, how, uh, but you know one thing is there, uh, it's not as arbitrary as you might think. 
uh, <laughs> because you know there is a certain uh, leveling process that goes on. As time goes on, you know, people uh, uh, cases come to court. You know, there's a certain leveling that happens, and uh, hopefully, I don't know. Uh, see, you have this problem with Sabri Mala, isn't it? Uh, it's a similar problem where you know there is a freedom of religion, right. where you have the freedom not to allow women into into your temple, mm -hmm. and then there is this whole uh, issue about equality. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I I think we'll have to uh, there there'll have to be some revisiting of your basic beliefs. I think you know b before we can resolve this.